Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 40, Unity. Take it away, Patrick. So I'll start off with a little bit of a rant. Pre versus post increment. So I got into a discussion with people at work. And for a long time, I have always just done... uh, So the, the biggest example is in a for loop, in the final variable change parameter, the normal one you do is an increment, a plus plus. And so I do uh, I plus plus or whatever. So for I equals yep. zero, I is less than 10, I plus plus. That's just always done it this way. Um, and if I put a, an increment on a line by itself, I do the plus plus. Like it just reads more naturally to me. Like this yeah, variable. You're taking the variable and you're incrementing it. You're not incrementing something that you're going to read later. So, uh, and then of course, if you put it in line with other stuff, I actually tend to try to avoid that, um, like in a statement because I actually find, like I will do it occasionally, but I find it to be a more cognitive load. So I'd rather, yep. uh, either have it be a post increment so that it just happens at the end and it's like I put it on another line or do it on a separate line all by itself. And so someone pointed out to me, in one of my code reviews that I was doing post increment and that the quote unquote standard we were using was pre increment. And I said, nah, that's not true. And so then I went through all of like I, you know, wrote a, a grep command to grep through all of our code. And sure enough, uh, except for just a couple small other cases from other people, everyone on the team had been doing pre increment except me. And all the code <laughs> checked in that was post increment, every single one of them except those like two other cases was me. And it was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> it was like one of those sinking moments where like I was hoping to be triumphant because like, ah, oh, see, everyone's using post increment sometimes. There's no standard. And then it was like, yeah, oh, I'm wrong. That's and the I don't know where it came when, from. The worst is when like, yeah, like it's, it's too late at that point. You know, like when the project starts, you can try to fight for what you believe in. But if, if, if it's been going on for six months and you've been doing it one way and everyone on the team has been doing it another way, then you just have to bite the bullet, man. That's So terrible. I did. So I... I swallowed my pride and uh, submitted a, a change to su- convert all of my post increments to pre increments. Uh, yeah. But I still, I still catch myself writing the post increments and then having to f- fix it later. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, like compilers now are so smart that the difference is kind of negligible. If anything, like, I don't even know if the instructions end up different at the end. You know, because like, the, if if one really was better than the other, the compiler. I mean, you know, there's no way to, there's no way you, that I know of. Actually, I guess maybe if you used a comma, right? Like if you had I plus plus comma and then like some more logic here, versus the like that's the only way where putting the prefix versus postfix, you know, and this this other logic also had an I like print I. That's yeah. the only way where you could end up with different behavior by swapping them. And nobody does that, right? No, no that, I would not allow that in a code review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. So anyways, um, I just have this bad... Like, I guess I looked it up at one point. I think they said it was like the original, the C book or whatever, Carnegie Richard, Richard Carnegie, something. Anyways, uh, Kerningham. Oh, why do I always forget the name? Wait, so uh, someone in your code review quoted a, a C book? No. A deceived programming book by Kerninghan. Oh, man, I always, always mess up the name. Uh, anyways, and then that one, I think, is where Brian Kerningham and Dennis Ritchie, I was combining the two. Okay, brain fart. Um, <laughs> the, in this book, they do the post increment like I did. And so, like, I guess maybe it's being from the States and going to college here in the United States. Like, the de facto way is writing it this way. Um, but I guess people from other places don't. They use the pre-increment. Um, and so that's just what they're used to. Uh, and then it's defensible to them, I guess. I don't know. Gotcha. But oh. everyone I've ever seen until that day had always done, like, and then, like, everyone on the team was doing pre-increment. I'm just like, what? How am I the <laughs> only one out here? I've never, like, been fussed at for this before. You should uh, so you should in, you should just have a comment. You should write a regex that puts a comment instead of every for loop, 
and it just says like this the only pre increment <laughs> symbol should be Murica. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So I'm just curious. Okay, but you're also post increment. So I'm trying to figure out where the preverse post came from. Yeah. So um, there was somebody on my team. Like, so in a um, for loop, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I don't think there's anyone can really make an argue that it matters from a compiler perspective. Um, so there right. has to be just like a legacy or like a you know so there was guideline. Someone on my someone last wrote. team who is really into the pre increment, and that person was from like a uh, Suriname, like former or post British Guyana, like South, uh, uh, South America. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it is like a American verse, like maybe people like Europeans and South Americans learned pre increment and we learned post increment somehow. I don't really know how that happened. I have, yeah, I have no idea, but yeah. All right. That's, anyways, uh, that's my, that's my rant. Uh, so onto an interesting topic. I was talking to someone about cooking. And so I actually enjoy cooking, um, and I uh, don't do it as much as I should. I'm a pretty busy at work, but um, I do enjoy when I do it uh, and baking. I've been baking bread recently. I have like a oh, not nice. a New Year's resolution, but like kind of a goal this year to. It doesn't last long, right? My parents used to bake bread, and it was like a brick two days later. You, like, you um, pretty much have to eat it that day. No, well, I don't end up having that much left over after the first day, but. Oh, okay. I don't make a lot of it, and it does tend to last two or three days at least. And then I typically really? either am tired of it or get rid of it. Oh, okay. Um, but you no, must be just, doing a better job. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't know that. Maybe I. No, I don't know. Um, but then I was like talking to people, like, "Oh no, I can't cook, whatever." And I'm like, "Well, you get instructions. It's like reading a program, and you just like follow the thing that recipe has." Yeah, you and really I find can't out, go wrong. Well, but I find out like it's actually very rare for people to follow recipes. I think, I think part of it is you have to fail. Like, for example, the first time I learned how to cook, I was just completely on my own. And, um, you know, I, they told me to, like, put the rice in. I just was making rice, like the simplest thing. They told me to put the rice in, put the water in, and then boil it or, like, simmer it for, I, I don't remember how many minutes, right? But I left it on hot. And I guess, you know, when you're supposed to simmer, you're supposed to put it on low. And it didn't, it didn't say simmer on low. It just said simmer, so I didn't know what that meant. And uh, I left, I came back, and like even like the pan itself was ruined. Like the rice <laughs> had just kind of like destroyed the enamel, like the Teflon on the pan. Uh. But the point is like, you know, you uh, either you get formal training or you just like make mistakes like that and destroy things. And I think like what you're talking about is actually a metaphor for a lot of things. Like there are people who are just afraid to like take kind of chances and like the ambiguity it, I don't I don't know if it's like afraid probably is like very is too strong language but it's more just like oh this is really ambiguous this is really hard I'm not going to try this versus I'm going to like fill in all the ambiguity you know by chance and then see what happens right yeah and, and I guess it's somewhat like people who so you can make mistakes like what you're saying or like where the, there's ambiguity in the instructions but let me all sorts of people who it's like well i've never made this dish before but uh you know i feel like i can do better than what this person's saying like oh they call for like a cup of milk uh, i don't have any milk uh, i'll just use a cup of butter instead it'll be the same <laughs> okay, that, that's kind of egregious but like I, people i talk to do this kind of stuff like oh i'll substitute you know it says like you know, X amount of flour. Well, the only flour I have is like almond flour. So like, it'll be okay. Um, it, it, yeah. And some of it's like not knowing, but it's just people don't like, the more I don't know, the more I try to like follow some guidepost, like the instructions or a YouTube video or like something. Uh, yep, I don't yep. pretend like I know better, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, you have to follow it closely and then you'll still probably make mistakes. But then over time, like I've gotten to the point now where, um, like for example, this morning I was making scrambled eggs and I just kind of like put in enough milk when I was mixing the eggs so that it just kind of looked right. And I was like, I've made so many scrambled eggs at this point. I don't have to really measure anything. But the first time you were going to make scrambled eggs, like, so the first time it's like, I followed the recipe like to a T. Exa like, yeah, I exactly. Even, okay. I bought like cream. I never even used cream. No one drinks coffee in this house, but like I bought cream cause it said to use cream instead of milk, you know? 
Yeah. Okay. So that's the same way I do it. Yeah. Okay. But apparently yeah. this is uncommon. And then people yeah, Lindsay, like don't understand Lindsay why they fail. Lindsay gives such a hard time for that. Like, uh, especially if I'm trying a brand new recipe and I have to do absolutely everything absolutely perfect. Oh, yes. There was one that had yes. a rub. It was a, it was a burger recipe and this was a rub and I was following the recipe kind of line by line. Um, and then the thing is, it didn't tell me how much of the rub to put on the meat. Like it didn't say, it didn't have like a, like Guideline, how much yeah. rub I made, how many pounds of meat I could season with it. And I was just like, oh no, like what if I over season it? And that's where you have to just bite the bullet and just hope you, you get it right, you know? Yeah. Cooking is uh, actually okay. so freaking fun. I like cooking. Yeah. So yeah. anyways, cooking, programming. Cooking. All right. <laughs> on to, on to actual technical topics. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we didn't do the ordering very well for the show, so I'm up first again. So you just hear a lot of uh, me no so far. Um, this is an article about why at Stack Exchange they still believe in private offices. So a lot of um, press has come out around several big companies talking about open offices where uh, gee, there aren't the many, many people kind of essentially sit in a large room and there may be like desk divisions in rows or pods, but essentially everyone's in an open room where you can just hear people shouting. This used to yep. be called a bullpen. Um, yeah, that's what I know it by. But now people call it more politely open office plan and it's oh, supposed okay. to be like a perk and it's deliberate and it's great. Uh, and that's like the new wave. But increasingly people are like, wait a second, this doesn't make sense for anyone except for like cost savings. Um, they try to so the the pros from the people who say open offices are good is that uh, you get dynamic interaction between people, right? So you're all at work. The purpose of being at work instead of just working at home is to be around other people. And so mm -hmm. when you have an open office plan, you're hearing conversations that you might not have otherwise. You interact with them, uh, and this is you know leads to big productivity boosts uh, in the long term. But the cons are you hear everyone and. People are loud or talking about stuff you're not interested. Uh, you can't. It's very hard to focus because anyone can just come up to you and start talking to you, and even if you're in the middle of something important. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of cons. And uh, the, you know, this article, Stack Exchange Company, is saying why they they believe in private offices. You can read this article. And from my standpoint, the I, I think they're somewhere in between. So some places have offices with only one to two people in them. Um, that to me is a little lonely and like maybe not good. So the best mm -hmm. I've had is I was in a room with like four to five people who were in a very, uh, s like the team was a you know, very specific part of a sub team. And so these people, I was people I worked together with a lot. And so I needed to have a lot of interaction with, and we had a mm -hmm. door we could close. So if we needed to have like a meeting, we didn't go somewhere. We just closed our door and had our meeting. Um, also like the chance of me interrupting someone who doesn't care about what I'm talking about is really low because like I become, these are people I work with day in and day out. So we all understand each other and we're more comfortable saying like, Hey, like not right now, like I'm busy or whatever. Um, and so I found like that four to six people in a quote unquote office closed space. That was like, for me, uh, some of the best work environment I've had. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I had, I've worked in places that had the huge bullpen. Actually we worked together at, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a, like a bullpen environment. And actually, in that case, it worked where we worked because it was very quiet. It was just naturally very quiet. Yes. <laughs> so that was an anomaly. I don't think that's normal. No. But, uh, um, but generally, yeah, I've worked in bullpen environments where, you know, it's just there's like, there's like an air hockey table behind you and there's like people playing ping pong next to you and, and you know, somebody else. Like, there's always someone coming back or going to something and it's just very distracting. It's like hard to focus. Um, but then, uh, you know, then the office environment, it can feel a little lonely. I mean, the situation I have now, there's two of us in an office and then there's just like rows of offices. And so, um, like most people just have their doors open. So it's kind of like having the bullpen kind of style where you can just yell at somebody like through your doors and it kind of works. It like, it looks like from this article that they the walls are made of glass that probably makes a tremendous difference you know because i mean that way it's like you don't have the noise but you can just easily just get somebody's attention too um but uh but yeah this is this is very hard there's no clear answer they all seem to have their ups and downs which one's your favorite you yeah, said your like favorite said, was I the office like, 
Yeah, with having an office people? with like four, four to six people. Just How do you more than six, six just gets too many. Office? That's a. It's not a normal. I mean, it's a bit. It's just. I mean, a room, right? Like office. Oh, oh, I see. So like, I can gotcha. have up to six people. I think when you get under, if you just have like one or two, I think there is a. You, like you're saying, for now, people might have their door open, but if the the it's very hard to control, right? Suddenly, the culture could just become everyone has their door closed, and then yeah, right. you lose all of that, right? Um, versus having your immediate team, which you it's really hard to work with a team of more than, you know, six people, like. It's not hard, but like you begin to end up with naturally some sort of sub teaming happening. Yeah, um, right. And so I think to me that that is the thing. When you have the big open spaces, people it's like, oh, put on headphones. It's like, well, a you can still come up and talk to me, and b if I have headphones on all the time, why am I not just at home? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. I can't hear yeah, these I mean, dynamic. The thing about the office is like when you really need to focus, you can close the door. And that's just kind of like the universal sign for like, I'm in the zone right now, you know, and like provided that like sort of you manage your door, like, uh, you know, responsibly, then that's <laughs> like, that, that's like a tremendous benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the next article is React Native. This is so freaking exciting because I've been wanting something like this forever. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of history. So, uh, so, well, first React Native is... Um, the React JS kind of paradigm, but applied to native. And so I'll tell you what that means. So, um, you know, we just, uh, we were talking before the show a little bit about kind of, you know, web and just how like HTML and JavaScript and CSS, these things have come such a long way and there's just so much infrastructure around them. And the browsers themselves are so complex and so efficient that laying out, you know, laying out uh, divs and, and, you know, getting good spacing and things like that, putting images in the right space, loading pages fast, et cetera, right? Um, it's just such a beautiful piece of infrastructure. And that making things for the web, especially, you know, things where you just want to display a lot of data or <coughs> things where you want some kind of interactive form or something like that, it's just, it's just nothing can really beat it. Um, on top of that, if you make a website, you make it for everybody, right? I mean, it, with a little bit of good CSS, you can make a website and it can work on mobile and on desktop and and uh, it just kind of magically works everywhere. And with respect to desktop, it actually like looks and feels good on everyone's desktop. Mobile, not so much, right? So, you know, originally Facebook tried to do the whole HTML5 app where they basically just took the Facebook website and, you know, just from a tech standpoint, like crushed it into an app where, you know, when you started Facebook, it looked like you're going to some native app, but it's really just taking you to a web page where, you know, the address bar and other things are hidden. So it just, it feels like, it feels like an app, but you're really, sh you're on the internet. Um, and the thing about it is on native, you know, and we could just argue this to death, like like why is like whether this is a good idea or whether this can change if it's like fundamental or not. But the reality is, the web experience on native sucks, right? Like the Android <laughs> browser, the the Chrome on iOS and on Android and WebKit, all of it is kind of terrible, um, and that's why Facebook bailed on the you know web, the web app app, and uh, went. I, I to wouldn't a say it's app. terrible. It's terrible f if you're trying to use like what we now accommodate as like an app like web app apps on those browsers are terrible <clears throat> let me think about that did i make that too many apps in a row so so like gmail oh, yeah. like gmail like i don't my gmail app it is a website but it's really an app um and to use that on those browsers is not a good experience for me but right. like going to a blog for instance like uh, I think the normal ones are fine. I actually don't like the apps that are like forum readers. They just don't work well for me. Yeah, that's um, a good point. So maybe what it is, I think actually to be more specific, I think that web app apps are in the uncanny valley where like, you know, they respond pretty well and everything. But when you, you know, say flip a switch and it's really just some kind of like JavaScript mock of what a native switch would look and feel like. It uh, behaves okay. just slightly different and, and it's different enough that it makes you hate yourself. 
It's in that uncanny valley. It's almost like if it, if you get it, like a completely different experience on the web, you're much better off than trying to make it feel like a native app, you know? Um, anyways, you don't have to do any of that nonsense because there's React Native now. It just came out. And so the idea is um, similar to how React JS is this JavaScript library that lets you build a bunch of widgets programmatically. And as the name suggests, all the widgets are reactive. So <clears throat> if I wanted to make, say, a chat program, all I do is I say, hey, here's a chat widget. It's um, backed by this array. Hey, here's a, um, you know, here's a button widget. It's, you know, when you press it, this function gets called. And then whenever you, know, you press the button, the function gets called. That's pretty clear. But also whenever that array changes, it re-renders your chat window. So you don't have to say something like, you know, listen for new chat messages when you get them, you know, clear out the window and redraw it. Like you just say, hey, look, this window is this chat array and it's just magically done. Um, so React Native is the same thing for native and it's cross-platform. So what these guys have done is they've defined like a, you know, like a button in this React um, JavaScript language and they've kept it very similar to the web. There are some differences of things which just didn't translate well, but some things like buttons are almost exactly the same. So you define some button in React JS and then on Android, you get a native Android button and on iOS, you get you know, the iOS button. Um, and if you define some a widget like map, for example, you'll get the you know native Apple Maps on iOS, and you'll get the native Google Maps on Android. So it, they they you know try their best to like you know do the right thing there. Um, and it's all reactive, like I said. So you know you could have a map widget, and you can say, okay, I have this location variable, and whenever this location variable changes, recenter my map. And it just magically works. So it's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if it's actually, I don't think it's out yet. So just read some articles on it. You know, they have Facebook put out some it's videos. Coming. And uh, be ready. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so our next article is Windows 10. Uh, and the exciting thing everyone wants to talk about about Windows 10 is the fact that Microsoft is moving to a free for consumers, asterisk, all sorts of caveats, potentially people, whether that's true or not. But the long story short is that it appears that Windows instead of, or Microsoft, sorry, instead of um, trying to gain a lot of money from selling new versions of Windows and, and waiting for people to upgrade, to try to make sure everyone's upgraded on to something vaguely resembling the latest version, uh, as opposed to tons of people still running Windows XP, um, mm -hmm. is to offer Windows 10 free as an upgrade to people who have, I think, at least Windows 7, if I read correctly. That's right, yeah. Um, so if you have Windows 7. 7 or later license, you can upgrade to Windows 10 for free. And then it looks like they're moving towards uh, updating again for free. So instead of uh, having very long-lasting OSs, it sounds like their intention is to move to kind of a more frequent cycle. Um, right. And then uh, that way that they can, again, push features and keep people on something Fresh, akin to what you get on Android or iOS, right? Instead of your computer just coming with an OS and just sticking with it. Um, if you, OS X does something similar, right? Like they update, yep. uh, what is it, about once a year or once every other year? Um, um, it depends. It more fre much more frequent than Windows um, from right. Microsoft. And so everyone's kind of assumed to be running something that is pretty new. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, there's a chicken and egg problem that this solves, right? Which is um, developers are sitting on Windows XP or Windows 7. Um, they're making apps using that. So, of course, they're really interested in backwards compatibility. And then you, know, you end up with no one having any reason to update. Um, like, you know, if, as soon as a program, like if, if tomorrow Steam told me, hey, you know, to run Steam, you need to have Windows 10. Well, then, shoot, I'm going on Windows 10. I mean, I have no choice. And so um, that's sort of, I think, the environment that they want to cultivate, one where, you know, there's no reason for people who already have Windows to not be on the latest. And then once, you know, say 90% of people running Windows are running 10, 
then developers can start saying, well, why am I going to support seven if you could just go to 10 for free and oh, everyone's done it? So then, you know, you'll see developers dropping support for older versions of Windows. Um, and that will, you know, force more people to upgrade and so on and so forth. So, and I think it's, it's you know, the other strategic thing for Microsoft is they want to start getting into this cloud business. Like they want to compete with Dropbox on, you know, cloud sharing and things like that. And so, you know, if, let's say something else comes out that's like Dropbox, but different. Like it's, you know, it's, it's a service, um, you know, it's like some kind of desktop app you download, um, but instead of share, synchronizing your files, it synchronizes your contacts, okay? So it's, it's, it's contact box. <laughs> <laughs> then like, uh, you know, if Windows, if Microsoft sees, oh, that's a pretty cool desktop app, they could bake it into Windows 11. They can come up with Microsoft contact box and it's part of the OS and they can kind of run these people out which is something they haven't been able to do in the past. So f strategically, it's a really good decision. Um, it probably should have been made like 20 years ago, but uh, I guess we'll let it slide. <laughs> um, so then the next article, this is pretty cool. I never knew this existed, but... Um, so if you're writing JavaScript right now on the web, you're writing um, ECMA script 5. And so the deal is, you know, ECMA script is like the formal um, definition of JavaScript, like the formal name of that language. Um, and most people are writing five. Um, now they're coming out with, you know, the JavaScript version six. Actually, it's already out. Um, but the problem is, you know, again, you have this adoption problem. Like if I write it in six, you know, 90% of the people aren't going to be able to use my website. Um, and so that's a problem. So they wrote this this transpiler. So basically, you can write your code as if everyone's running the latest bleeding edge, you know, Chrome or Firefox. Um, and for people who aren't, they can run the JavaScript 5 version of your code. And it, maybe it's a little slower or something like that, but functionally it should do exactly the same thing. And uh, it allows you to sort of make that transition and start writing JavaScript 6 now. It's pretty cool. Very nice. Time for book of the show. Book, 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 book of, the, of show. the show. My book of the show, it's kind of a, a little different than usual, but I actually found out that there's this magazine called Game Developer Magazine. And... Uh, they stopped printing issues, I think, like five, six years ago. Um, and you, But you can actually get all of the issues for free. So it's pretty cool. I mean, you can just flip through um, literally any issue of this magazine. You can just download it and flip through a PDF of it. So um, if you're into game development or you're uh, um, into sort of the history of, of game development, things like that, this is a pretty cool uh, resource to check out. I think I remember reading that magazine in college. I think there was like issues around the computer science building somewhere. Uh, nice. Everybody wanted to be a game developer in college. So. Yeah, that's true. If you ask around software engineers, like almost everybody says, oh, I got into it because I wanted to make games. Well, I should have uh, specified, yeah, in a computer science area. I don't think if you walked <laughs> to random pieces of campus, it probably would have said that. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I didn't go <laughs> to those places. To I would have just gotten beat up. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, those sports, uh, sports, um, sports injury majors just crush us. Uh, that's a topic for another time. Um, my book of the week is a book of the show is Mistborn: The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson, which I've recommended. I think at least one other book of his before, uh, and this is a book I just finished. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, oh, yeah. I guess it's considered fantasy. Um, okay. But it was very suspenseful. It's a little long, but uh, I, not the longest way ever. But it, it, it just, for whatever reason, it was like very action packed on my edge of my seat and it was like really enjoying it. Um, Is it part of like a series or could you just so, read yep. this one? So uh, you could just read this one, but when you get to the end, you will want to read the next one. Uh, and I oh, think, it's the beginning of a series. Yeah, I think there's three in the series and then I think maybe a prequel or something that they wrote later. Um, but this uh, is the okay. first one I read. Uh, and I try not to read too much, even like the titles of like other books in a series, because I'm always afraid it's going to be like a spoiler. 
Um, yeah, yeah, right. And I don't want to say too much about this book either, um, but it involves, uh, there's some stuff about like a little bit of like alchemy almost in it, um, which is kind of cool. Okay. So, but I, I very, very much enjoyed this book and I just started on the second one. Like I went to start listening to another book. Uh, so I listened to a lot of my books on audio during my commute. And so um, I went to start like, you know, reading, listening to another book and uh, I was just like, no, I want to go find out what happens. So I like started this book, the second one of this series. So it was that good. Cool. Do you use the, uh, what is it called? <clears throat> um, the books on tape audible? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. I want to look into that. I don't, uh, I've never used it before, but now I started taking the shuttle um, just because I don't, it's uh, it's just kind of more convenient, but it does make the commute longer because that's the stop. Uh, so, yeah, I'm looking for something to do. Yeah, um, I totally do that. So the library also is a good source of audiobooks. Um, oh, cool. Even online, cool. They, so they have books on CD, um, which of course you can do, uh, or mm-hmm. they have a lot of them. Um, there's I think it's called OverDrive, which is like essentially Audible, but like for the library. Um, oh, okay. And so you should check that out. I read a lot of specifically like science fiction, and so they tend not to have the books I'm really interested in. Um, but gotcha. I do browse every so often, and there are good books on there. So cool, cool. Check it out. Um, Time for all right. tool of the show. It's a tool of the show. My tool of the show. I can't believe that I haven't done this one already. But I flipped through the archives, and it's the first time. But this is probably my favorite tool ever Ever. Um, it's meld ever it is meld you say this every show amazing so basically just take whatever you know about diff tools and throw it out the window because meld just just makes it so much easier um it's so meld is a diff tool so you know it compares um two or three files and it will show you the differences either between the two or among the three files. Um, so you can you can hook meld into git. Um, so if you ever do like a git diff or a git merge, meld will just automatically come up and take over. Um, it's pretty awesome. If you do like a git merge and there's a merge conflict, meld will pop up and the left panel will show what you have. The right panel will show what is on the remote and the middle will show what Git tried to do automatically, um, which you know will be like somewhere in the middle, right? Um, but it's pretty cool. You can also, if you are in a Git repository, you can just type meld, and it will automatically diff what you have, like your working copy against the repository, like against head. So if you want to do like instead of doing like a Git diff. Um, you get like a graphical git diff kind of for free. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty awesome. Um, it has a couple of issues on Mac. Um, it's kind of, there's some, there's some problems there. I'm um, actually, I want to put together like a meld Mac package. The issue is right now meld uses the X quartz, which is like max X 11 kind of rendering interface. Um, but it can use regular quartz. It just has to be recompiled. So um, I'll probably put together like a package for that or something. Maybe try and like put it in homebrew or something like that. But even the X11 is like pretty decent. Um, and if you're on, you know, OS 10 or I'm sorry, if you're on uh, Linux or uh, Windows, it just it just magically works. So yep. I uh, use Mel, this is what I out. use. I use Mel. Yeah. Oh, you use Mel? Nice. Yeah. It's yeah. good stuff. Although I, I think when I do git diff, it just gives me the, uh, I have to give diff tool will bring it up. Um, yeah, so. you have to do, actually, you have to do diff tool, and then you have to pass dash dash dir dash diff. Oh, so, I, don't, I don't type that. Oh, yeah, so the way, you know, to diff tool, it it assumes that whatever tool you're using can only diff one file at a time. Oh. So it keeps popping yeah, up. Yeah, it just says, keeps hey, saying launch yes or no. Yeah, yeah. So if you do dash dash dear diff, then it knows to take the entire diff and put it in mail. Oh, I'm going to try that tomorrow because I use this tool. Yeah. Day, so. Yeah, yeah. And if you do like, uh, if you configure your Git uh, in a certain way, then you don't even have to do the diff tool or the dear diff. When I mean, you I'm do a regular well. diff, 
it's just it just magically works nice these are valuable yeah. tips jason <laughs> and you just give them away for free for free can you believe it actually I, it costs money to give them away like we we pay for the bandwidth so other people can learn this for free my tool of the show is not nearly as useful but it is guaranteed to uh no it's not guaranteed to anything it will waste time <laughs> So this is an okay. iOS game. I think they said they're coming out for Android as well. Uh, I should be more diligent about looking that up. I do most of my quote-unquote video gaming uh, on my iPad uh, in the evenings. And so um, this is called Space Marshals. Uh, and this okay. is a game for the iPad. Uh, and I think iPhone too, but I know definitely on the iPad. That's where I play on iOS. And it is a tactical shooter. So um, a dual stick tactical shooter, and rather than running around and trying to shoot lots of things, um, you're, it's kind of almost like Metal Gear Solid in like that you're trying to crouch and hide, and then you're trying to avoid the attention of the guards, and you can do things like throw rocks that make noises, and then the, the guards will walk over to see what's happening, and then you can ambush them from behind. Um, but if you shoot them with a loud gun, it'll alert the other guards. So then you may want to choose like a quiet gun that does less damage, but is quiet. Um, and so there's all sorts of interesting trades and mechanisms for encouraging you to replay the level and do better and you get a score. And based on how good you do, you get rewards. Um, and so they just announced, and I'm very excited, that they're coming out. The first one is only, I think, uh, 10 or 14 levels. doesn't take terribly long. Um, and it was kind of like, oh, this is a little bit short. But they're going to come out with the second set of levels uh, as a free update to the game. And so oh, nice. uh, it'll get more gameplay, which will be awesome. So is, these one, is this one of these like pay-to-win kind of games? No. Or is it like a, I, I think you just it, you buy the game, and then I don't, like, I don't think you can pay anything more. Oh, great. That's perfect. Yeah. I'm not a big in-app purchase person. No. I've gotten to the point now where if there's in-app purchases, I'll almost never install it. Like I'm, I'm it has to be something way, yeah. where it's like content, you know, like buy another level or something. Then I'll think about it. But if I go to the in-app purchases and it's like any kind of BS currency, like if there's if if it's like there are rubies, five hundred five hundred rubies six, yeah, I'm like forget it, I'm out. <laughs> uh, but I really enjoyed this game. This game's a lot of fun, uh, and it's good cool, too because I'll check I, this out. The, the dual stick shooter thing. A lot of ga- a lot of games I don't feel like go well on the tablets, um, just because like precision nature. But due to the pacing of this one, I feel like it works really well. So definitely check it out. Yeah, is it? Do you think it will work on the phone, or is it the kind of like I? Even if they built it for the phone, would the user interface like with the dual analog? Except sticks for your work? like finger covering up a decent sized portion of the screen, I think it would work. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. All right. So, time so, for our discussion of Unity. Unity. Um, yeah, so first to talk about Unity, we have to talk about game engines, of which Unity is one. Um, what? I know. So a lot of people, you know, when they first try to make a game, I know I did this. You probably did this too, Patrick. You, you you try to you don't use a game engine. Like when I my first game that I made, I used um, um, just like I guess like Visual Basic or something, or uh, I think it was like C plus plus, but it was like the uh, GDI. That's what it was called. Like it's where like the uh. Windows. You actually like it was like a desktop application where I was like drawing circles and stuff on like an actual, you know, desktop window. Yeah, I was right. I was doing like raw OpenGL calls. Oh, so you're like moving like on C++. up already. Yeah. <laughs> so what I learned is that it just, it, there was constant flickering because the circles weren't being drawn um, and erased at the same rate as the monitor was refreshing. So, you know, you'd have a circle erased and before you could redraw it, the monitor would refresh and so sometimes the circle was there, sometimes it wasn't. Um, and so you just end up with all these weird issues that, you know, you don't really think about. Um, you know, when you're designing a website or something like that, you don't think about weird things like flickering and frames per second and things like that because the browser is kind of doing all that for you and because things aren't really moving around that fast. And if they are, you're using Flash or something like that. 
Um, but when you deal with a game engine, or when you're dealing with a game where there's a lot of objects moving all over the place, maybe there's a camera, and the camera you know, is moving, you know, your eyes are effectively moving, which means the whole universe is going in the other direction. Um, that's where you end up with all these weird artifacts and slowness and things like that. And so game engines are these sort of low level, you know, drawing, music playing, you know, uh, uh, you know, physics engines that can run very quickly and can give people sort of immediate feedback in, in a world where things are constantly changing. Yeah, I think the difference um, is like when you're writing, uh, you know, a Windows application or a Mac application, you have a UI, but it's just a basically a bunch of event handlers that fire when the user does something versus in a game. Yeah, there's stuff going on all the time, right? Like creatures are moving around. The enemies are doing something like stuff is always happening. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so typically games are designed to run at 60 FPS. I know that like when they do backporting, so, you know, if you try and run Grand Theft Auto four on Xbox 360, it runs at 30 FPS, but for the most part, things run at 60 FPS. And what that means is that 60 frames per second. So you have one sixtieth of a second to do everything like, you know, everything Patrick was talking about, like all those people, they have to move, like take a little bit of a step forward. Uh, you know, all the cars, they have to move a little bit forward. They all have to make noise. Um, you know, the camera, if you're moving forward, that means the whole world has to move backwards to give you the feeling of going forward. And all that has to happen and get pushed to the graphics card, the sound card, and all those other peripherals in 16 milliseconds, which is, which is, which is no time at all. Um, so this would be really hard for you to do by, uh, you know, um, by scratch. It would be, it would be pretty, it'd be pretty much impossible. And well, I, mean, I, I know you you can't do it, but what you end up doing is recreating most of what a game engine provides. You yeah, end up that's writing right. it yourself, I mean, right? Like this is what happened to me. I wrote this game, and I was like, oh, I need to handle the death sequence of like the character, and I was like, oh this is something later I've realized like, Oh, game engines just have like these kinds of things thought out. Like there's a level start and a level end, um, or yep. a game start and a game end versus me. Like I had to write like, Oh, I'm in a splash screen. Now I'm in the game. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, if you actually, I don't think it's even possible. Like if you just, if you wanted to make a game, and you want it to be like very interactive 3D, things like that, and run in real time, but not use like OpenGL or DirectX, it's pretty much impossible because those are the ways, those are the APIs that give you access to the graphics card. And OpenAL or Direct Sound, that's how you get access to the sound card. Otherwise, you just, you, you're not able to use, you know, all of the hardware on the machine and you can't, you know, you can't run fast enough. <clears throat> um, so yeah so you need very special APIs which give you um, a ton of like uh, control, an incredible amount of control so that you can do things very quickly but they also will allow you to do very bad things <laughs> um, like if you you know and OpenGL is a lot better now but actually there was a time where I gave Patrick a, remember I gave you a version of MAME this is we were traveling for work Yes, I do remember and, this. And uh, I gave Patrick a version of MAME that had some bad OpenGL code, and his screen flipped. In yep. other words, like like his yep. screen rotated 90 degrees, and it stayed that way. I had to reboot <laughs> like, it. Even when yeah. he closed the program, his laptop screen, like he had to turn his head to read everything until he shut down. So, I mean, that's the kind of control you get, but it but it comes at a big price. Um. The other so thing that a game engine is really imp like uh, known for is, is, which Patrick alluded, alluded to earlier, is the content creation pipeline. So you know you might have an artist or a game designer, um, and he's not a programmer, right? I mean, he's just somebody who knows a lot about games and sort of how to, uh, you know, where to reward the player for exploring and how to create like nice niches, how to how create, to make them um, buy that in-game in currency Jason hates. 
Yeah, how to buy like an extra hundred twiddly bits. Um, like where to create kind of funnels where you can create a lot of action and force people to have to experience that action. So there's not like large parts of the game that people aren't experiencing. Um, so they know a lot about sort of the game design and the storytelling, but they know nothing about coding. And so there needs to be a way for those people to take the scripts that you write for them and and inject them into the game using some kind of nice graphical environment. And there has to be a way for you know, the artists to take, you know, pictures of backdrops, take like little 3D models that they're making in some completely separate third-party program and, uh, uh, you know, and feed that into your game engine. Like someone might make a death animation in Blender and then go to 3D Studio Max to make like a dialogue animation and somehow these things need to flow into your game engine so you know commercial or popular you know open source game engines will have a content creation pipeline yeah even how to take a model and like get the polygon drawing that OpenGL needs to do right like this is something that you have to code by yourself when you're writing an OpenGL or find an individual library for every aspect of it this is one of the pains for us was like how do we? What is a tool that we can integrate well that allows us to use any 3D modeling program to create a model of a, you know, boat, and put it in the game and not have to like draw every individual polygon? Yeah, exactly. Yep. <clears throat> and then you, know, you get into texturing, and there's just there's a whole world full of of um, like you know content related tools and things like that that you know that a game engine has to support. Um, there's some other kind of more modular parts of a game engine, you know, AI, um, you know, pathfinding or some kind of state machine. Um, there's physics engines, you know, like Angry Birds where, you know, you launch the bird and it goes kind of flying through the air and crashes um, and reacts kind of like a, like a ping pong uh, or sorry, like a pool table, like a billiards table. Um, so all of these are kind of, you know, a game engine will typically have, you know, modules for all of these other tasks. Um, <clears throat> so now we've kind of described game engines. Let's kind of walk through sort of a history of game engines. Um, well, maybe so a little less of a history, more of like an overview. Yeah, that's true. History's boring. It won't be like a chronological. Yeah, there's a ton of game engines that came out in the past. Like, I mean, the id soft, like id one, id two, id three. The games like you know Duke Nukem and all of those. There is engines behind all of those, but. Um, it would it would take us all day to cover the first cover game engine I ever engines. used, and this is a pretty high level uh, game engine. It's called like RPG Maker, and this is I think still like they still make versions of it to today. And that's basically if there are a lot of RPG games which are really similar, like Japanese RPGs of a certain mm -hmm. era. Think like Final Fantasy three, four, five, like that that time range. Um, yep. Or what would that be like? Dragon Quest. Four, uh, three, like six, I think. Up to like maybe six. So like before, kind of. Well, at least the ones I was using before three D. They're all very similar. You've got some guy on a world map, and he kind of wanders around, and occasionally yep. he gets a random fight, and then occasionally he like goes into some town, and then there's like a more detailed Zelda esque, like detailed city map, and he goes around, and typically there aren't random fights there, or there may be, or whatever. Um, and so what it does is, is it created a very generic kind of game like this, but then allowed you to make the sprite for your hero and the sprite for your party and how many people would you allow in your party. And when you go into the town, here's a character. What do they look like? What script do they follow? And you would type out the script. And, you know, here's what tiles do you want to use for the city? Um, and they had like a lot of, I guess, template games, which you could start oh, okay. with and then kind of like modify. And it was almost like a choose your own adventure to build an RPG make RPG. And then at the end of gotcha. it, like you could start with an example project and just change the name of the characters or, you know, change Could you the like invent your own, uh, like sort of like leveling system. I feel like that's, that's a big part of these games is sort of like how the character progression. Is. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm trying to remember now correctly, but at a minimum, like you could specify kind of like how you wanted, like this monster gives this many experience points. So of course, oh, okay. like, the first thing you do because you want to be awesome is like this monster has like one health and like a million experience points, right? But that doesn't <laughs> yeah, make for like a fun game, but that's what you do because it's fun. Um, yeah, and so yeah. stuff like that. But then, you know, ultimately at the time, like I wasn't really into programming 
Uh, so this is like pretty early on. And so I didn't get into the whole like scripting part of it as much, but that's a big aspect as well. Like how do you do leveling? Like, well, here's your generic leveling system, but if you want to write your own, you can too. Um, yeah, right. I, I played this, I had this one called Unlimited Adventures, which is very similar to RPG Maker, but it was from the Forgotten Realms people. So okay. it was all like the Dungeons and Dragons rule base. And the first thing I did, I made this um, thing where like you, you walk to the town and when you entered the town, there was a huge battle between these like 400 city guards versus like 120 dragons. And, uh, and the battle took like three hours. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, this is totally awesome. And I gave it to a friend of mine. And he's like, yeah, I let that run overnight. And I came back and it was, you know, like it, my computer had crashed. <laughs> so it was like, I realized it was like actually really hard to make a good game. <laughs> like one that's, that's true. Like um, as a game developer, you get caught up in like the mechanics and things like that. And then you end up like kind of self-absorbed. Then you give it to somebody who, you know, isn't, like hasn't been like walking through the development process and they're like yeah this is crap <laughs> yeah yeah um and so similar to the description of rpg maker i guess in a way is i remember playing all the lucas arts point and click adventures um yep. and these all run on a similar it's called scum oh the name just escaped escaped me it's like scripting for uh, script it script creation utility for maniac mansion i, I looked it up i cheated um, ah, okay. And so these were, uh, if you remember, like the Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. I remember playing this game, and it was so oh, hard. Hey, I had to like there? barely had just got the internet, and I would, like go on the internet and look up like how do you get past this level? Uh, Grim Fandango, um, what are those? Like the Monkey Island uh, games. These were all games that were written in this uh, scum language, and you would be able to provide like here's the verbs I want to use. Here's the nouns I want to use, uh, and here's the picture of the town that I want this adventure to take place and where the special areas are. Yeah, so I've used Scum VM uh, a little bit. They had a game that was free, or I guess like GPL or something on Scum VM called like, was it like a Flight of the Amazon Queen or something like that? And there was another one called Beneath the Steel Sky. Have you played these ones? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. That was pretty amazing. Um, so you can write your own uh, using the same same engine. Is it hard to make? Like, I mean, is it some weird format, or is it... Do they have a Scum VM maker? I've not actually tried that one, so I don't know. Yeah, we should, I should... I'll check it out. I should. I should try one, I guess. We should make a crazy adventure game where you have to survive Silicon Valley. I, I think you should have to survive having uh, two kids running around the house causing havoc. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like playing on find, impossible. <laughs> find the TV remote that one of your children is deliberately hiding because they think it's funny. <laughs> Use belt on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. I'm just kidding. Uh, do low that. level game engines. Uh, yeah, seriously. So these seriously, don't, don't ever do don't. That. Okay, low level game engine. Um, so so we talked about high level, you know, RPG Maker, Scum VM, things like that, and we'll talk about Unity. But uh, a lot of these, like, they don't give you kind of raw access, right? So, <clears throat> um, you know, in say you can't, they're not generic. You can't use them to make any kind of game you want. Right. The ones we've talked about so far. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like if you, um, if you want to, like, you can't make a flight simulator in RPG Maker. Yeah, exactly. You know, it doesn't make sense. So, I mean, at the low level, like, what is every game doing um, nowadays? Right, it's doing one of two things: either drawing triangles in 3D that are getting kind of crushed into 2D by the GPU, getting rasterized, um, or they're drawing. Um, sprites in 2d so which are just kind of you know pictures that they're drawing in 2d or some combination of the two right same thing with audio what are you doing you're taking a variety of audio signals that are positioned in either 2d or 3d um and then you are muxing them together uh uh 
or mixing them together into you know one signal and then sending that to like an audio processor, right? So what these low-level engines do is they they try to abstract as much as possible while still giving you the freedom to do what we just described, like to make any game you could ever want. Um, so the most common one is SDL. So SDL is um, you know has things like you know add audio track or you know draw 2D box, draw sprite, move sprite, things like that. And then under the hood, they've written what that means, you know, in a hundred different platforms. So if you draw a box on Windows, or if you draw a box on Linux, or on the iPhone, or on the, you know, Android phone, or whatever, there's a, there's a line of code that handles that. So SDL, just think of it as like the same draw box function implemented like 30 different ways so that when you call it, you don't have to think about it. Um, SMFL is similar. It's a little bit more modern, but it's the same idea. Um, there's also <coughs> this combination of three libraries, Ogre, OIS, and OpenAL. Ogre does graphics, OIS does input, and OpenAL does sound. And when you put the three of them together, you have kind of the same thing. Um, there's Hacks, which is very similar. Um, and then something that's becoming much more popular now is the whole HTML5 Canvas thing, which is pretty cool. So, you know, in Canvas, you can say, like, raw things, like draw a circle, move a circle, things like that. And, um, and then it will sort of do the right thing. So on the iPhone, the HTML5 Canvas will call whatever the, you know, low-level draw circle function is for the iPhone. So, um, yeah, the low-level ones are cool. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. Like, if you use a low-level, as the name suggests, you're going to be writing a lot more code. I mean, talking about, like, the uh, content creation stuff we mentioned earlier, you're going to be doing all of that from scratch. And that's going to take, you know, months and months. But, you but know... That's the fun part. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But if you want to make something like, say, Minecraft, which is just very, very different, like, uh, you know, Minecraft... It's it's the world is made up of like a billion of those little cubes, and you can't just draw a billion cubes in 16 milliseconds. It just doesn't work. So you have to be really clever about which cubes I draw and stuff like that. And so whenever you need that much kind of precise control, then you have to use a low-level engine. Um, and that's why you don't see a lot of like really fancy artwork and things like that in Minecraft, because they. Um, you can't just take some model that you made in like Blender with the animations and everything and just put it in Minecraft and it magically work. Um, yeah, if you're gonna yeah. do everything, you need a disproportionately large team, the more you're gonna do, right? Like if you're gonna do everything from scratch. Right. Um, you need more and more people and then more people to handle the, the interactions between them. Yeah, exactly. So you end up with like 100 person game teams. Yeah, can you imagine like a hundred people all working to make one? Is that reasonable? I mean, I feel like I saw something about some of the games now getting to that size. Yeah, I, I totally believe it, but uh, that's pretty wild. I mean, I, there's, I think there's the other day I was uh, talking to a friend of mine who worked at EA, and he said there was, there's like a handful of people who work on the Madden football, and all they do is the grass. Like, they try and make the grass look as realistic as possible. But there's, like, an army of people just for the grass. So, it happens. Yeah, I, it's, yeah. like you said, it's, <laughs> it's not surprising. Yeah. Um, so, okay, Unity. So, Unity is, you know, a high-level game engine. So, it's, you know, doing a lot of work for you. Um, the basic premise behind Unity is that you have... Um, this thing called prefabs, <clears throat> and the idea is this: let's say you're, uh, let's say you're making some Grand Theft Auto level, right? So you have a bunch of streets, and at the end of every street, you have a traffic light. Well, you don't want to have to create, you know, ten billion traffic lights, and then oh, you know, I don't really like the way the traffic light looks, so I have to go and change all of them, and it would take forever. So this idea called a prefab, where you sort of design one traffic light 
that you know kind of looks really well and captures as much of the essence of all the traffic lights as you can capture. Um, and then you just instantiate that prefab all over the place. And so then if later on, if your boss comes to you and says, hey, I really want the traffic lights to be orange instead of yellow, you could change the prefab and then all of the objects in your world magically you know, get corrected. Um, so that's kind of the premise behind Unity. Um, so you have prefabs, you have game objects, which are instances of prefabs, and then you can assign scripts to either. So you can say, you know, all traffic lights will use this script. Um, and so in a way it's very kind of functional be, uh, because you don't really, there's no guarantees on the order of the scripts and things like that, especially if you're creating objects dynamically. And so, you know, there's some like update function that captures how traffic lights interact with things around them. Time. And, and move uh, over time, yeah, change over time. Yeah, yeah, and, and so that function just kind of runs and the traffic lights all kind of work independently. So when you move to one of these uh, game engines, but specifically Unity, one of the things that Jason was talking about before is that you gain cross-platformness, to, to say it that way. Uh, and so that is that if you are running on desktop and you decide you want to move to iOS because you heard that was the hotness, or to Android, <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you can. You can take your game that's mostly developed and with very little work, just run it on the others because you're working at a higher level. And so those abstractions handle moving to the other platforms. That's right. That's right. And even you can even write in three different languages um, and it all just kind of gets compiled down to the same thing. So Unity has Unity Script, which is kind of like JavaScript, but uh, you know, it uh, doesn't have all the same like functions, uh, all the same features of JavaScript and the syntax is a little different. There's Unity C Sharp, which is, you know, exactly C Sharp in terms of syntax, but, you know, not all the libraries from C Sharp are there. It's kind of like a subset of C Sharp. And then there's Boo, which is this language just inspired by Python as a syntax that's similar to Python. But, uh, um, but again, it's only for Unity. Um, and so it's pretty cool. You can, you know, you can have a team of people and they don't necessarily all have to be writing in the same language, although it'd probably be better <laughs> if everyone <laughs> is consistent. But you can have a, you know, a Unity script script for your traffic light that, you know, calls a Unity C Sharp script to say, is there anyone around me? Like, is there anyone within 100 meters? And if there is, then the traffic light yells at them or something. Um, so I thought, you know, it was uh, it was pretty cool how like you um, can kind of design all of these scripts independently and then see sort of, I think this is called emergent behavior where it's sort of like the sum is greater than, you know, or the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so it's like you design this traffic light and it kind of tries to react to anything that comes near it. And then, you know, you design cars, you design people and, and eventually you end up with this, this thing that feels very lifelike and you end up with these kind of very complex behaviors that you could have never really scripted. Um, another thing about Unity that's pretty cool, it um, has all of those things we talked about. It has, you know, the content creation. You can easily take models from Blender, Maya, 3D Studio and import them into Unity. Um, and also a lot of people have written plugins for Unity. Some of them cost money, um, some of them are free. But, uh, you know, someone even wrote like a Minecraft um, kind of plugin. Somebody else wrote a plugin for doing like toon shading. So if you want your game to look like, you know, it's a cartoon. Um, and so, you know, the plugins are really what's going to get you closer to one of these low level game engines. Like when you need to do something that Unity can't handle, then you can rely on one of these plugins. So you're not, you're not just totally lost. All of those plugins and the framework to handle plugins and the cross compatibility do give you a productivity boost. So instead of spending time creating them all from your on your own and essentially creating your own version of those things, you are able to offload that to people who have already done it. And that saves you time and gets you down to the cool part about figuring out your awesome AI or your witty story or your amazing animations. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, but that comes at a price. <laughs> so, you know, all those a people... cost who, in U.S. dollars. That's right. All those people who made all of those low-level things want to get paid. And so um, you can use the base Unity for free, but um, it's pretty limiting. I mean, you can't really use plugins. So, you know, even if someone else made a plugin that fixes your problem or that, you know, adds some functionality to Unity that you need, you can't use it because you only have the basic. Um, to use plugins or to make your own plugins, you have to get Unity Pro, which uh, it's $1,500 base. And then if you want to do Android, it's another $1,500. If you want to do iOS, it's another $1,500. So if, to, to publish a game on Android, iOS, and desktop with Unity Pro, you have to spend $4,500, which is just pretty steep. <laughs> I mean, good, good job. You math, can, math. Yeah, hopefully you can make that money back in sales, but that's rather tough. I mean, so is it possible with so you you looked more at this than me, but the if you have just the Unity base, could you make a game? Maybe you couldn't release it on iOS because of this fee, but is it possible to make a game on the desktop that would be actually like people would pay to play? Um, yeah, you definitely could do it. Um, I think you might even be able to make a Unity. So the Unity Pro for iOS costs money. But you can use the Unity Basic on any of the platforms for free. So you can oh, even okay. make an Android game and charge for it. Um, the only thing is, uh, other than you know not getting the plugins and a bunch of other features like skeletal animation and some things like that, uh, or like this inverse kinematics. Um, but other than that, you uh, have a Unity splash screen. So you know when someone launches your app, the first thing they'll see is like powered by Unity for a few seconds, which you know. That's okay. not too bad. And um, if my app makes it to the big leagues and sells a million copies, do I owe some fee per copy? To, to I don't think it's... Is it per copy? I know that uh, if you sell more than, I think it's like 100 grand, or maybe it's even 10 grand, then you have to buy Pro. So part of their license says you can't make oh, more okay. than a certain amount. Um, but I don't think there's any kind of rev share model or anything like that. So I think that uh, once you pay for the Pro, and I'm just double checking now. Yeah, once you pay for the Pro, like you own it. If you make a billion dollars, it's fine. That's nice. Yeah. So you could, but you could do it, you could try it out. And if you make a game you think is awesome, you could ship it. And then when you get to 100,000 and you deal with it, I guess that's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can get away with Unity Basic, then um, yeah. You can you can always push the, put the game out and then retroactively pay them. I'm sure they wouldn't mind. <laughs> but uh. one thing about Unity is that for what you get, it's actually remarkably cheap. Like the Unreal Engine, I think is like a hundred thousand or something ridiculous. Unreal Engine pricing. So if you want Unreal Engine four, it is. It doesn't even say. So I know that uh, the GitHub student package, did we talk about that last time? If you're a student and you register with the .edu address, you can go to like GitHub and they have like all these free services. Oh and yeah, that's right. Trial things. Um, I, I thought we talked about it, but if we didn't, you should check it I out. I think we talked think about it like three or four episodes ago. Yeah. There, I think they offer, uh, I know they offer, I think an Unreal Engine uh, license or something you can use for small time stuff. Uh, and getting a taste for it as part of that package. Oh, okay. Nice. So, ironically, uh, Unreal 4, they just changed their pricing model recently, and now it's $20 per month plus 5% of your revenue. Ah, okay. So now it's that's kind of like an interesting dynamic. I mean, because, I mean, 5% is really nothing, right? Like, even... Even if you made a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, then uh, that's 5, just thousand. five grand, which is the price of Unity for all of the, uh, oh yeah, OSs. So, yeah, so I'm I'm looking at it now on Git. If you're a, if you are a student, which presumably probably means you have a .edu email address, that's typically how they do that. Um, it, the GitHub Student Pack includes uh, a subscription to Unreal Engine Four. Gotcha. So you don't have to pay the twenty dollars a month. I don't know what happens if you make like a billion dollars. I I don't know. 
Wow, that's amazing. Actually, the Unreal Engine, you get the entire source code for the engine, which is something you don't get with Unity, even with the Pro version, um, which is pretty cool. I mean, if you ever wanted to know how like a game engine works, you could just get this subscription for a month and then cancel it. And for 20 bucks, I mean, even if you're not a student, then for 20 bucks, you get the source code for UE4 and you can check out how it works. It's pretty amazing. Cool. All right. Well, so. I think that's a wrap. Thanks to you all for listening. Yeah. So, you know, short story is Unity is pretty awesome. Um, it takes some getting used to. It's definitely not, it's definitely intended for, you know, game designers. Um, and I learned very quickly that, uh, that uh, I'm not a game designer. <laughs> so you had a bunch of stick figures running around the screen. It yes. did, yeah, it didn't feel natural to me. I, I kind of wanted like, I'm like, oh, well, how am I going to design this like crazy particle engine? And then I realized like, this is really meant for like building a gigantic level and having a bunch of like experiences. And I was thinking about more in terms of like, like I was thinking about like a board game engine that would like play any board game. And like, kind of like encode the rules in a script, and it's just like I was trying to like put a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> but, uh. but uh, for people who are like designing a real game and have kind of a background in game design, I think this is an amazing tool. Very nice. So cool. All right. Until next time. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. Catch you later. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.